best thing is to develop some rapport. So especially if you're working with indigenous people, just say, hi, how are you? And you know, maybe get to know a bit about, about them. Do they have a family? Where are they from? Um, and that kind of will just ease them. And uh, so when you start asking some pretty personal questions, they're, they're more likely to respond to you and feel more comfortable to be able to, uh, to answer those questions. For us, the, our culture is very important because there's a level of respect the medicines we make, the foods we eat, um, how we teach, um, it's all a level of respect and how we how we bring it about and teach a younger generation to keep those cultural practices going. We do um, a lot of berry picking, we do a lot of canning, preserving our foods for the winter times through drying and through freezing. And, um, so summer times is really our harvest time when we're, we're busy out in the bush picking medicines, um, berries, um, and then we do a lot of fishing. We do our fishes, fish several ways, like you know, we can them, we dry them, we half dry them, and we, um, and same with the, when we have a moose. Um, we do the same thing, we can them and we dry them and then half dry and then freeze a lot of it fish out of the jar compared to a piece of pizza out of a frozen box. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a healthier choice. Traditionally, it's, it's been going on for years and years and years, as far as, as far as I can remember. From being young, my grandmother did it and my, on both sides, and my mom and my aunties. The dialogue is generally very story-based, um, so people like to really share you share their story with you. So just to really sit back and let them talk for three three minutes or five minutes uh, to kind of talk about what they're, they're concerned about. When I get into the habit of just kind of rapid fire questioning to kind of get either information to support or go against my hypothesis, you know, it tends to shut down the interview. Some people are just straight up front and they'll tell you what's happening and you, and you deal with it. But some people, you can kind of see something's happening so you kind of have to prod on it. A sensitive question or um, something that they may have any embarrassment about or they're very nervous about out, um, they usually will bring it up last. So they may bring up something much more benign, um, like, oh, I'm here for a blood pressure check and, um, you know, something like that before they get to, you know, I'm having, you know, I've been noticing I have blood in my stool. In some cases, you just have to really watch out when you're just about to leave the door and they, they bring something up. That, that might be the crucial moment where um, they're going to tell you something that they, they've been having a hard time disclosing. And so they, that might be the, the, the big issue that they didn't want to talk to you initially about, but found the courage to just before you left. Our voice has been silenced for so long, it's really hard for people. And it's really hard to people like, you know, you always say, oh, we're all born equal, you know, why don't you people just get over it? But, but it, it, that's not true because after five generations of not being heard and, and being herded, um, it's really hard for people to stand up and, and get what they need, especially like out of healthcare, out of education. Um, a lot of the different things where you see um, where we're hurting. We've always been told you know where we fit in, and we and we ourselves don't don't sort of demand that the 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 control of our our health healthcare and education. As a medical professional, you need to uh, bring out plain English, speak to them on terms that they will understand, because if you use high tech medical technology words, they're not going to understand. And they can go back to their family saying, I don't know what the doctor said, but he said I had this and I think it's a deadly disease. In the context of working with First Nations people, that comes with an onus to do, be very self-reflective over our own cultural values and biases, which we all have. Um, and so it's not like a shaming the practitioner thing, it's just um, being aware that sometimes we'll all treat people with less respect than they deserve just because of um, our human nature. <laughs> um, but it's about being mindful when that happens. Like, um, thinking about the times, like, how, when did that, like, um, when did one encounter with a First Nations person go really well? And um, what was the dynamic there, you know, as a self um, reflective exercise versus, you know, an encounter that didn't go well? When it comes to reciprocity, so First Nations people historically, and I feel like it goes on, is that they, um, money was never really a thing, so it was all about trade um, 
and that includes trades of knowledge and healing and that sort of thing when it comes to sharing gifts or services, I guess. Having people come in and do all this work is not that they're not grateful, but um, there's often becomes this like separation because they feel, you know, they often may feel like they're not giving anything back, that they're not doing anything. And so it sours the relationship or at least doesn't allow it to flourish. And so often when I tell people is go out to the local communities, like go to the band office, introduce yourself. Um, you know, you don't have to be pushy about it, but um, most First Nation communities like that I've lived in and that I've worked with are usually very, very open um, and generous with people who are generally interested. Um, and so that allows them to f feel like they're doing their part of reciprocity. So they're, um, so you're meeting them where they're at and they're able to build relationship with you, um, you know, in their strength um, when there's not that power differential. Um, also community gatherings like health fairs, um, things like that are also great places to help forge that, um, that feeling of reciprocity. The trust thing is a big one for the doctors, like they need yeah. to trust our people. We don't just go to the doctors just for the sake of going to the doctors. We we mean business when we go to the doctor. <laughs> if you want trust, if you want to build trust with anybody, come to their, go to their community events and go speak with the people and be there with the people. And that way um, you have everything in place for them and, and the trust is there and they know they can go to you. I guess if they have time, they could come to community events if they want. Relationship is um, something that does take time. So um, a lot of people have kind of program burnout. So a lot of people don't even want to go to anything that's labeled a program anymore, like a diabetes program or a woman's program, because they know there's an expiration date. When funding runs out or when the people move on, the program's going to end. Um, and so there's kind of this still uh, mistrust with things. Um, and so just being present, being there, being consistent um, over the long haul um, builds that trust. Um, and you get to know the families and the dynamics and, um, and that will help things a lot because people then, um, you kind of already know a background so people don't have to necessarily tell you all the things um, because you kind of have that knowledge and that's helpful because oftentimes, you know, with a population that, you know, has a history of being heavily traumatized, having to relive that with every new practitioner is hard. Um, and there's no way to kind of get around that. Uh, I think if you're working with anybody, these are important because there's First Nations people everywhere, but um, is something called the ABCs. So thinking about Aboriginality, barriers and colonization. So essentially um, be, get, getting an understanding of what it means to be um, an Aboriginal person or an Indigenous person, which is the term we prefer in Canada. And so that means that we have like, most Indigenous um, cultures, although vastly different, have very common threads. And so some of the common threads are the fact that we do believe in a creator and a mother earth, and that the combination of the two has what um, gave us everything we have that the spirit that we're all connected. So you treat everybody with respect and integrity because if you're harming other people, you're actually just harming yourself. If you're harming the earth, you're harming yourself. If you're harming, harming our four-legged friends, you're harming yourself. Um, so it's this idea that, you know, be the best person you can be so that you minimize the harm that you do to yourself. For me, uh, I'm a little um, non, trusting person to uh, give my life story but I need to like I need to learn a person's personality whether it's a doctor or a nurse or whoever I'm more prone to uh, honesty for me I need to spend a lot of time I mean they don't need to uh, or I don't need to uh, pour out my my uh, life stories all the time I mean, it'll take time, you know, to build that trust, you know, boundaries, whatever you want to call it, you know, because um, you can't just jump in and say, okay, I will, you know, trust who you are, because I've been hurt by that, I've been betrayed by that, so 
it'll take time for me. To provide service for Indigenous people, particularly First Nations, it's nice to understand some of the services they have provided. So they have a um, um, non-insured health benefits drug list that shows all the uh, drugs that are covered for First Nation people. So when I'm talking to a First Nation patient, I, I review it and um, see which medication because sometimes they're only covered for five milligrams uh, of, a, of a drug as opposed to two and a half. So you have to just really know which drugs are covered too. So when you when you when you prescribe it, that they're they're gonna, they're going to be actually covered and if not are they going to pay for it if, if they want to do that or are there other alternative options so that's a that's a great thing to kind of look at. People may have a vastly different social economic background than you do so they may not have a vehicle and that may be something they won't share with you because they're embarrassed or they may not have the gas money even if they do to come and see you. Understanding what are the barriers that the people you're seeing faced very very important to understand and the history because if you don't understand where we came from it's going to be really hard to understand what you see now um, so understanding residential schools and what had happened to some of the um, people who went through that and then the multi-generational effects of that you know when people are engaged in medicine that they believe in that ties them to their culture and their traditions it makes them stronger um, you know there's very few drugs now that are completely incompatible with any sort of herbal remedies or a lot of herbal remedies. It can be married. Um, so if people want to engage in both, I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, and you know, if you're not sure based on if they're on very complicated or sensitive um, Western medical therapies, um, there's great pharmacists that work in the hospitals and some in the community that you know this is their expertise. Um, that go and look at all the nuances of how maybe certain herbal remedies may affect um, their, their Western therapies. The medicine we use is blessed by the person that picks it. I'm using traditional medicines like I probably have arthritis and I always use it all the time. If they totally believe that that medicine is going to work on them and it's between them and the creator again to start with that belief work. You know when people are engaged in medicine that they believe in that ties them to their culture and their traditions it makes them stronger um, and and that can only like lead to um, positive outcomes. Mm -hmm.